Hi, thanks for being here. Um, not the ideal circumstances that I wasn't able to join you. I know I was very excited about being at the Abilities Expo in person, devastated that I can't be there. I had invested a lot of time and energy in, in the opportunity to come and be with you. But anyways, we do um, the best that we can. And I know that you are here because somebody in your life, whether it's a, a friend or a family member, somebody that you love or somebody that you work with or yourself has questions about accessibility. And we are always looking and needing to learn new things about accessibility. I called this workshop Save Stress and Reduce Energy. <laughs> Watch out for the cats. Accessibility does both. Because that's what I have learned in the past six years. And the reason why I was so excited about coming to the Abilities Expo was because I wanted to be the person that I needed six years ago when I needed to learn how to make my 115 year old farmhouse more accessible. And I was thinking about building and I had no idea what I needed to consider for, for building. And I didn't find that person and I had to do a lot of research myself. And um, in, in the end, we built this fantastic accessible home and I wanted to share what I learned with you, which is why I wrote both my books, Build Your Space and Building Better Bathrooms. I'll talk about those um, later. But because I'm, I'm not in best form, um, I'm coming to you with this pre-recorded video and with sort of my, my best ofs in terms of the best parts of my house, the best parts of the work that I do. As an accessibility consultant, as an RHFAC professional, um, I've done lots of ratings of buildings and accessibility audits like airports to condominiums and um, recreation centers. And I always find little things and I always learn new things, new ways of making spaces accessible for a greater number of people. So I hope that today you will um, take at least one nugget of information away with you that you can put into your file folder of how to make spaces better. And I'll give you one, one, one last example. Um, Megan, who is a co-op student working with me right now, she, a part of her onboarding was to go through all of uh, the courses that I have created that are, that are online. And she herself has a disability, has lived with it her whole 22 years. And even though she has lived with her disability for 22 years, she's still learning new ways to create accessibility for herself. And um, one of my kitchen videos, she, she learned about how I changed the location of my, of my taps to be on the right-hand side of the sink to reduce the amount of reach. And with her limited range of motion with her arms, she thought that that would be a really great way for her to save some energy and have a bit more ability in her kitchen. So be open-minded and always willing to learn new things and always try to, um, to think there's got to be a way to do this in a way that saves me energy. And I'm here to help you do that. Um, you can send me an email. I'm sorry I'm not here to answer questions live and in person. Um, and I'll tell you how to, to find me at the, end of, at the end of the video. Hi, I'm Julie Sachuk of Sachuk Accessible Solutions. I'm really excited that you are here today, especially you picked a beautiful day to visit my home. My favorite compliment from one of my clients when they came to see my house was that if they didn't know that I was a wheelchair user, they would never have guessed that this house was built for accessibility. So we're gonna start with that. And I look forward to showing you around my new house, but first we're gonna head over to the old house. We're gonna go in and remember we are deconstructing. <laughs> because of um, municipal bylaws, we can't have two dwellings on the property at the same time. So this house is coming down in the next couple of weeks. We're trying to get as many things out of it as possible because we hate for it to go to the landfill. Anyways, enough about that. Let's go into the house and um, I'm gonna show you what it feels like to have to access a house using a ramp. So we'll do that first. And as with old farmhouses, there's no such thing as level. 
So when this house was originally built, it was one level, then an addition was added, another addition, another addition. And of course, none of them are at the same height. So we're gonna join the cats and roll into the old house. So this is how I came and went every time I came and went from the house. Very narrow entry. Now that I do that, I think, how on earth did I manage that every day? So come on in. It's slightly embarrassing, but remember it's 110 years old, so I'm good with it. The things that I wanna point out while we're here are the non-level floors. Of course, I'm sitting in a level spot. Let me try that again. The non-level floors. This is where the fridge used to be. And every time I would open the fridge, I would roll away from it as I reached in to get something. So I had to apply my brakes and just took extra energy. The bathroom is here. And when we um, moved the bedroom down, we moved it into the living room because everybody likes to sleep in the living room. And so what that meant is when I showered, I had to roll through the kitchen, the public space of the house, dripping wet, naked, etc., to go into the bedroom and get dressed. So not ideal for privacy, independence, dignity, all of those um, high level goals that we have when trying to build accessible spaces. So I want to talk about energy and it's one of the reasons why coming here to go out with my family or friends is so easy. It's something called spoon theory. Spoon, like spoon. You can also relate it to like HP in a video game. Spoon theory is not something that I invented, but I really like it as an analogy. So when you go about your average day, you wake up in the morning, you have six spoons worth of energy for the whole day. So all of the energy that goes into using the bathroom, having a shower, getting dressed, getting your breakfast, making coffee, making your lunch, and heading out the door to go to work, that might be one spoon. If you then get in and out of your car a couple of times, maybe you pop into the grocery store, um, you go about your work day, there's probably maybe two spoons gone. So you only have three spoons left. And as you get towards the end of the day, just like everybody, we get tired, we get worn out, um, we need to pick me up of an afternoon coffee. But eventually you're gonna start to not have enough spoons to get to the rest of, to get through the rest of your day. And this is where the accessibility of a space really, really makes a difference. So I could choose to go home at the end of my work day because I'm out of spoons, or maybe I only have one spoon left, or I can choose to go to a place where I know it is going to be accessible and it's not going to cost me more energy. Because what happens is if it costs me more energy than what I have left available at the end of the day, then I start borrowing spoons from the future. So the six spoons that I have for tomorrow, I've already used one of those spoons. And it's not just about energy in the day, it could be how you slept the night before. Everybody knows when you have a crappy night of sleep, you don't feel great the next day. So you've already borrowed a spoon from the future. Maybe you have had a day of much higher pain than normal. So you're already short on spoons when you wake up in the morning. So it's like HP in a video game. As you run out of HP, you have to do something to boost that back up, right? Like eat or whatever, have a nap in your Minecraft bed. There's ways to get around that. And for me, the biggest way to get around with, to get around losing spoons throughout the day is to make sure that I'm spending my time in spaces that are accessible. So for me, it's at home or coming to a place like this that where I know I'm not gonna have to expend extra energy. In all of the time that we spent researching and planning to build this house, we visited lots of people. I did tons of internet research, Pinterest, everything. 
and we still didn't have all of the answers that we needed. We just kind of learned as we went. And I realized that when we were done building that I didn't want to just keep it all in my head and that I needed to write it down. And so I did. I wrote this book called Build Your Space. And it's basically the journey of all of the lessons that we learned and lots of hints and tips for building your own space to make it right for you. So come on in. I, I'm so excited that you're coming in with me. Um, I know that, you know, this isn't exactly how I wanted to do things. I wanted people to come to my house. I want to show them what it's like to build for access. But this way is actually great because you get to see a taste of all of the spaces um, in our accessible house so that you know how you might do it for you or for your client. Come on in. I'm sure you know and you've experienced with every project, there's always something that you would do differently. And there's certainly a few of those things around here, um, decisions that if we were to do it again, we would do differently. But in general, this place has been a real game changer for me and my physical energy. I had a friend who um, built a house 10 years ago. She has MS and she used to say to me, oh, Julie, just wait until your new house is ready and you move in there. You're going to have so much more energy. And I kind of didn't believe her. I just thought she was just, you know, saying that to be nice. So then we moved in at just before Christmas and after, you know, the glow of being in the new house and Christmas was over, I still had more energy. And I thought, okay, what's going on? Like, really? And then I started to think about all of the things that were different about how I functioned every day in the bathroom, in the kitchen, getting in and out of the house and all of that stuff that I was doing, with the ramps and the uneven floors and the reach, all of that was sucking energy from my day. And now I have energy to work. I have energy to exercise. I have energy to do things with my kids, go out. It really has made a difference. And the thing is, there is no one size fits all solution, but there are solutions for the people that need accessibility. And we can work together to find those solutions. You will know the answers for making the space the way it needs to be exactly. Welcome to my bathroom, the most important room in the house. It's not just toilet, shower, sink. It's everything, flooring, storage, and all of the hundreds of little decisions that go into making it exactly the way you need it to be for yourself or for your client. There's so much to talk about that 30 seconds in the bathroom can never cover everything, but know that I am ready to help you walk through all of those decisions. Even just talking about the toilet, there's like 15 different things to think about when choosing a toilet. The toilet. This is like a standard commercial toilet. Um, it is floor mounted as opposed to wall mounted, right? The tank is not just attached to the wall. And the height of the toilet, this is like a medium tall toilet, I would say. So if I do this, you can see a little bit better the height of the toilet. And the shape of the toilet here, this is not a round bowl. This is what we would call an oval or an oblong um, toilet bowl, which gives greater length which for somebody like me is particularly helpful. And I'm gonna get into the details as to why that is. So the other feature that is the most obvious is the U-shaped toilet seat. So it has that front opening. Now, prior to me needing an accessible toilet, I kind of thought that like front open toilet setup was like a man thing, you know what I mean? Um, but now I know differently that it's an accessibility feature because it allows more space for somebody who needs to get their hand between their legs. And yes, everybody does it, but when you can't stand up to do it, it's challenging. So it just gives you more space. Looking at the toilet tank, um, that gives me something to lean against. 
right? I don't have core strength. That's why I have um, a back rest on my wheelchair so that I have something to lean against um, because basically my core strength ends right about here at about my bra line. So I need something to lean against while I am seated on the toilet. The other thing that you can do in uh, to, to create something to lean against is having that seat lid, right? And I know in um, some facilities, it means that it's an extra piece to possibly break or need to be cleaned, but it, provi it provides protection between plumbing and a person's spine. So my spine, I have like no, um, no fat tissue, no muscle tissue. It's basically just skin and bone. So if I'm leaning against bare plumbing, like in an industrial style toilet, then I'm really grinding my spine against that and I can bruise my spine or, you know, damage, cause a skin issue. So having something to lean against is really, really important. So if you don't have a toilet tank, please install a seat lid, a toilet seat lid so that there's something there to lean against. So I transferred to the toilet from the front. Um, a lot of people do it differently. In fact, everybody that I talk to, everybody does it a little bit differently. Keep my chair close enough that it's not gonna roll away. So looking at the toilet itself, it's a tall toilet. Short toilet makes that transfer back into the chair uh, much more difficult. You require more strength. There's more possibility for injury. The seat itself has a front opening and the bowl is oblong. And what that does is it gives um, more space between the legs so that you can get your hand between your legs because if you can't stand, then that's something that um, is needed to, to help out. The toilet seat has a back rest and I also have a toilet tank. So I've got something to lean against. Um, my lack of core strength because of my spinal cord injury means I need somewhere to lean in order to balance. Um, we've got grab bars on either side of the toilet. I only use horizontal bars um, because I use them for leverage and balance. So I lean side to side to pull my pants down and pull my pants up. And then I use the horizontal bars for leverage to get back into my wheelchair. I'll show you that in a minute. You'll notice that the toilet roll is below the grab bar. If you put that toilet roll above the grab bar, then you are interfering with the space that is needed to get the leverage, um, especially those commercial toilet rolls that are really, really big. Um, they take up the space so that I would be hitting it with my elbow and not able to get the leverage that I need. They are horizontal, they are not angled. Angled grab bars are a thing of the past. They really don't help anybody. Um, the proper setup would be a horizontal with a vertical bar and that vertical bar helps somebody lift themselves up so they have use of their legs but they maybe just don't have the strength that they need to get themselves up and off the toilet. So that's where that vertical grab bar comes in. Um, yeah, I think those are the basics, and I'm going to show you how I transfer back into my chair. Julie Sawchuk here to talk to you again about grab bars. I've got two different grab bars in this bathroom, and I want to show you that not all grab bars are created equal. And you know, there are some that work in some situations and some that don't. So I'm going to have to transfer onto the toilet to show you the difference between these, these two bars. And they're often in the upright position, so it means I have to move them down. So this one pulls down. And if I were in my chair, I would be able to reach and do that. This one actually locks in place. So I have to lift up to pull it down, which I can't do when I'm seated in my wheelchair. I don't have the reach and the strength to do that. 
So a bar that locks up in place is useful in some situations, like where um, a, a caregiver might be involved and the person sitting on the toilet, you don't want them to pull down the grab bar. So you want to keep it locked up and out of place until it's ready to be used. But in a situation like this, having one that locks means a person who's you know, at the front of the toilet can't just pull it down to make it useful. So that's the tricky part of this. And this bar, I wanted to show you that both the bottom bar and the top bar are, be, are able to be used because they're slightly on an angle from one another. So if this is the right height for you for a transfer or for support, then you can use that because your arm has space because of the offset. Whereas here, you can't get that same angle. Um, the other reason why there's drop down on both sides of the toilet is because of the distance from the wall. So the center line of the toilet is farther than um, what would make an L bar useful. It's too far, you'd be reaching too far and putting um, strain on your shoulder to do a transfer that way. So that's why they did the two fold down bars. They were repurposed bars, which is why there are two different ones. And I also want you to see that behind the toilet, if the toilet's running. Behind the toilet, they have put up some backing so that there was a solid attachment for the grab bar instead of, um, you know, trying to find the stud and then placing the grab bar where the stud is or just screwing it into the drywall, which of course never works. Um, the backing goes all the way behind the toilet and both the grab bars are screwed into the backing to provide support. So there's some um, more information that you wanted to know about fold down grab bars. So we've talked about the specific spaces of the bathroom and the kitchen, but when you're talking about building or renovating a whole house or a section of a house, you need to look at all of the quote unquote regular house decisions through the eyes of accessibility. Things like flooring, electrical, heat source, plumbing, lighting, windows, even window treatments. All of those things can be um, tweaked slightly to make it work best for the user. We, for example, have the same flooring throughout the house, so there's no thresholds between rooms. There's no little bumps or um, changes in flooring surfaces where I'm gonna get my wheels caught up. Um, even heat source, which really helps somebody um, like me who has a, a neurological condition that doesn't allow the body to regulate temperature. Lots of bright light, it's good for the mind. So there's a lot of ways to make it just, you know, up a level so that it's right for everybody. Accessible kitchen design and construction is more than about cooking. You have to consider storage, entertainment, um, just space to be together. And this is my favorite place in the whole house, aside from my bathroom, because I roll up under here, I do my prep work here, we have breakfast here, sometimes this is my office if my desk gets too messy. So there's a lot to consider, it's not just about the roll under cooktop or the low height microwave, we have no uppers and we have everything in a pantry. Appliances, counter heights, counter finishes, edges, drawers, Again, thousands of decisions to be made in a regular house, and then you add the layer of looking at it through the lens of accessibility, just to make it exactly the way you want it. The other thing I wanted to talk about is the height of the counter in relation to the windows. I love my view, I love my windows, and when I was planning the house, I would go through home you know, home deck magazines, and I'd always end up pulling out the pictures that had beautiful windows with like a forest in the background, and I'd say, oh, this is what I want. And then we did it, and I was surprised when we got here because I wasn't able to see out that side of the house, so I kind of forgot what this part of the property looked like. And I can open the windows, right? I wasn't able to do that in the other house. I couldn't even see out the windows, let alone be able to open them. So planning so that you can have access because it's nice to just be able to get fresh air into the house. Lots of counter surface. 
Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's a bad thing. Let's talk about sinks for a minute. The, what I call the dishwashing sink, is a regular standard stainless steel sink. It's a little bit deeper than I would have wanted it to be. Um, when it comes to planning your list of fixtures and appliances, be very, very specific. Uh, I gave a list to my plumber and I thought I was being specific enough, but I, but I wasn't and it ended up arriving um, quite a bit deeper than I would have liked for it to be. And it, if it were, you know, even an inch, not as deep, an inch shallower, I would be more comfortable doing the dishes. We've got a lever tap and a spray nozzle, um, all super easy to control. And then the second sink is what I call my prep sink. And you'll notice it's basically just a bar sink, but we've turned the faucet to be on the right hand side. That's my dominant side. And it just prevents having to reach over top. So if I'm working here, having to reach over top versus having to reach right there to turn the water on and off. Now, here's a learning point. When we installed the sink, I realized that it is a little deeper again than I wanted it to be. And my knees actually touch the bottom surface of the sink. And when it went in, I was like, okay, that's fine. You know, I didn't want to change it. I'll just be careful. Well, why do I need to be careful? Because steel transfers heat very, very easily. So when I had a boiling pot of potatoes, brought it over here to strain, boiling water out of the pot and my knee was right under the sink. Yeah, I burned my knee quite substantially. I had a blister pop up almost instantly. Um, so a hard way to learn a lesson, um, but take it from me, don't compromise with your safety. If there's something that you figure out after the fact, change it, fix it. Um, hmm. I should be eating my words because I still haven't changed the sink, but I definitely don't ever roll my knees underneath it. Even just the sun, when the sun comes in and heats up that, the surface, the bottom of the sink, it's hot enough that it would burn my skin. So I'm uber careful. You'll notice that we don't have uppers. The only uppers are the ones that are above the fridge and that's where the good dishes are stored. I don't use the good dishes when I'm by myself. So if we need the good dishes, I just get my husband or somebody who's visiting to get them out and bring them down. So eliminating the upper storage meant that you have to be creative with all of the other storage that you do have. And when you have roll under spaces, that even eliminates more. So being creative and um, thinking about what it is you want to put into those storage spaces that is what takes a lot of time and thought, you know, what do I want to be able to have access to? How much space does it need to have a lot of little appliances? You don't want them to be indoors where you, you know, they get pushed to the back. When you have drawers, things come out to you instead of you having to go down into a cupboard. So even the pots and pans are in drawers everything pulls out. So the garbage pulls out, the cleaning supplies pull out, and that works for everyone. Everyone benefits from that. Drawers underneath the oven, drawers underneath the, um, the storage for the baking supplies. This is my favorite thing too, because my pans are organized and not just stacked on top of one another. And then this drawer pulls out as well. So I can still reach some stuff that's up there. And then the chips are on the top shelf, so I can't reach them. We'll talk about counters next. Talking about a couple of things that I would do differently if I were to do this again. One of the components about a kitchen is what they call this space right here, which is called toe kick. And if you are standing at this counter, your feet are kind of going under there like that. So what we attempted to do was raise that toe kick up so that my toes would be able to fit and I'd be able to have more reach over top of the counter, but we didn't quite get it right. And the higher you make it, 
the more you lose from your drawers. So if I were to do it again, I would just do a regular toe kick because it didn't really make a difference anyways. And then the depth of this island, I can barely reach halfway. So I would actually make it a foot less deep because then I'd be able to wipe the counter to the middle on this side and then go around and wipe the counter on the, on the other side instead of missing like a two inch strip of dust down the middle of the island. The height, it's not my favorite, but it's also not where I work and it is the favorite of other people that work in the kitchen. So I think that's it for kitchen. Oh no, there's one more thing. Um, I'm gonna go around this way so that you can see it. We did run electrical up and through the island so that we could have a plug on this side. that also controls the lights. Then the last part I think is my pantry. So follow me. And it's kind of like having my own little personal grocery store. It's a big space. Okay. So yes, it's a big space, but we have a freezer in here. The fridge is a full fridge in the kitchen. And we did that because I wanted to be able to reach as much of the fridge as possible. So it's floor to top fridge. And then we have the upright freezer here. The storage decisions were for it to be open so that there's like one less thing that you have to do to reach the jar of cashews, for example. And the shelves are all shallow so that you're not having to dig behind things to find what you're looking for. Everything that I use is on one of these four shelves and the things that are on the top shelves are the things that I don't need, like mm, the marshmallows, for example, although the bottle of wine's up high and I'm not really sure how that ended up happening. So we also have some electrical outlets in here. This is where the toaster oven lives, um, which is convenient because the bread is just on the shelf behind me. Storage of small appliances, um, storage of canned goods, all of that kind of stuff. Make yourself be creative with your storage. I think that's it for the kitchen. The other aspect about safety is that whole idea of having an emergency escape um, and more than one. You've seen the wooden ramp that got us up to the main door. This is the back door or the second uh, I guess maybe the third escape um, from the main floor of the house and you can see that there is no ramp there. Um, it was our intention to install a ramp there for emergency if I couldn't get to the main door but we never did and I guess I am lucky that I lived to tell because you know in case of a fire and I couldn't get through the kitchen to get to that ramp and get out of the house then I would have been out of my chair and dragging my butt down these steps to get away from the house. Um, the other exit went into the garage, which also went down steps. So always have a backup plan. And when we go back into the new house, I'm gonna show you all the different ways that we created um, safe spaces for exit. The last part to get finished with this build was the outside space, but it was kind of saving the best till last. So come on out, I'm gonna show you my patio. have enough room to move, to dance, to garden, to entertain and barbecue. And my wall here, my special wall, I can actually get out of my chair and roll in the grass. Entertainment space, relaxing, room for everybody. And just to be outside, like I said before, that whole idea of um, being active and helping your mind really has been a game changer for me. Thank you for coming. Reducing stress and saving energy. Who doesn't want to do that, right? So send me an email, julie at juliesawchuck.ca. Make sure you spell sawchuck right.
often people put an extra C in it. So it's S-A-W-C-H-U-K, and that's .ca. Um, you can go to my website, juliesachuk.ca, and I have a special offer for people at the show. Um, you can go to booth 421, where you'll find Chris and Handicup. That's my Handicup right here. He has my books for sale because he's an awesome guy. Um, so you can get both books for $50. Otherwise, you can order them from me on my website or from Amazon. I hope you'll pick them up today. And you also get access to my courses for the show special. You get all three courses, um, accessible bathroom design, accessible kitchen design, and accessible home design. They are available at juliesachuk.info slash ADC. And you also have a flyer in your bag that gives you that information because if you pull out that flyer, it gives you the promo code of SHOW22 to get a discount. So I look forward to hearing from you. Please read my books. Tell me what you think. Tell me what I missed and what I can put in my next versions. And um, we'll see you at the Abilities Expo next year. I promise I'll be there. Thanks again for coming. My books are available, Building Better Bathrooms and Build Your Space for the show special of $50. And all you have to do is go to booth 421, talk to Chris at Handy Cup, and he will help you buy those books for $50 and you can take them home today. The other thing you have available as a show special are my three courses, Accessible Design and Construction for Whole Home, Bathroom and Kitchen, the show special of $395, you buy it this weekend and you get to take those two books home with you as well by going to see Chris at booth 421. Use the website juliesachuk.info slash ADC and the discount code SHOW22. You can also find me on YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. All you have to do is Google my name. The Julie Sachuk is what I am on Instagram. I look forward to connecting with you. Take care, everyone.